a film excursion into past events, events which form the patterns by which we live today. Retrospect is brought to you by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization in cooperation with your local civil defense office and your local station. And now here's your host, Douglas Edwards. There is always a certain amount of excitement when we revisit the past, venturing back over the years. There isn't a decade in modern times that had as wide a swing, as chaotic a transformation as the 1930s. To paraphrase a well-worn thought, it ran the gamut. Here in America, we just come through the get-rich-quick years of going places and doing things. The jazz age had been a decade of wonderful nonsense. It had also been a time of economic fantasy. But America's debt to reality had to come due. The stock market crashed on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929. On the morning after the happiness years, the nation woke up with a hangover and a broken heart. The world's richest and supposedly soundest economy perished, and small business was strangled by the Great Depression. The unemployed numbered 15 million. There were bread lines, soup kitchens, and street corner apple sellers. The rhythm of ragtime had become a funeral dirge. The corpse of prosperity was abroad in the land. In 1932, America sought new leadership as the panacea for all its troubles. Franklin Roosevelt promised a new deal for the American people, but depression and tragedy would divert all else for another eight years. The 30s witnessed the crime of the century, the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby for which the ruthless Bruno Hauptmann went to the electric chair. Congress armed the FBI with the Lindbergh Law and the Bank Act. The days of the public enemy were numbered. Huey Long found a solution to the national problem. Every man a king, said the kingfish. For every man a guaranteed annual income of $5,000. He called it share the wealth. It was a good idea, but unfortunately, there wasn't any wealth to share. America was not alone in despair. Mussolini had invaded Ethiopia in 1935. Haile Selassie appeared before the League of Nations to ask for justice. God and history will remember your decision, he said. Before God and history, the likes of Hitler could rejoice over the League of Nations' failure and use it as a mandate to break the Versailles Treaty and send his troops goose-stepping into the Rhineland. Europe became a playground for dictators. Spain in 1936 saw the bloodiest civil war in modern history. Germany and Italy fed planes and guns to the rebels, while Russia supported the loyalists. Spain became the battleground for conflicting ideologies. It lasted three years, lost a million lives, and it served as a full dress rehearsal for World War II. The 30s could also lay claim to the worst disaster in the history of aviation. At Lakehurst, New Jersey, as it approached its mooring mast, the German dirigible Hindenburg suddenly burst into flames. Within minutes, the huge aircraft was reduced to ashes. 36 lives were lost. The grim pattern of tragedy continued. Amelia Earhart, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic, embarked on a round-the-world flight, never to return. The beloved cowboy philosopher, Will Rogers, who never met a man he didn't like, who said to friends like Vice President John Nance Garner, politics has got so expensive that it takes lots of money to even get beat. With Wiley Post, the great humorist died in a plane crash near Point Barrow, Alaska. In 1936, the abdication of Edward VIII rocked the British Empire. The woman I love became the most famous phrase of the decade. In America, while people claimed it could not happen here, it was happening here. The Nazi German Bund hired Madison Square Garden. The rally was fraught with brown shirts, swastikas, and for one who voiced dissent, a generous display of Nazi tactics. 1938, Neville Chamberlain waved a scrap of white paper containing the promises of a madman. Hitler could afford an arrogant smirk. He had sold the free world a pig and a poke. 
The 30s ended with the ironic, disembodied phrase, peace in our time, ringing in the ears of mankind. Most of us really believed it meant peace in our time, but belief is not as powerful a deterrent as preparedness. Peace in our time means preparedness. The nation prepared for nuclear war is the nation destined to survive. When the warning signals sound, what should we do? Should we take shelter or do we start leaving the city? Is it shelter or is it evacuation? Which will save the most lives? That's the important thing. To answer these questions, We've asked Mr. William Downer of the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization to be our guest on today's program. Mr. Downer, does civil defense advocate shelter or evacuation as the best means of survival? Our policy has always been shelter and or evacuation. Both, of course, are dependent on two factors, warning time and local conditions. That's why the decision can only be made at the local level. And in some cases, that decision cannot be made until the actual alert comes. Uh, many of our cities have dual plans, depending on local conditions. Won't the speed of guided missiles make evacuation impossible? Not in most areas, at least not in the foreseeable future. Uh, a great many missiles launched in complete secrecy is not now feasible. Also, there's the possibility of a strategic warning. Is that advance warning, Mr. Donner? Yes, that's right. Suppose international tensions reach a point where the president declares a state of a national emergency. This means that target cities could begin in a strategic evacuation. All non-essential personnel could be moved out of the cities into safer areas. Of course, this would only be done when the world situation demanded it. Here's another point to keep in mind. The suburbs and rural areas would not need to evacuate. Only the downtown areas of most target cities would attempt evacuation. But again, and I cannot stress this too much, it depends on local conditions and local officials must make the decisions. Obviously, no one in Washington, D.C. could begin to determine whether uh, evacuation is best for Middletown, USA. Just think of the number of unknown factors involved, road conditions, time of day, warning time, number of people to be evacuated, number of routes leading out of the city, and so forth. Still, many people think evacuation of a large metropolitan city would be nearly impossible. Now look at it this way, Mr. Edwards. You're caught with two hours warning. You're in the center of the city with traffic control, with planning, with everyone moving out of the city in the same direction, don't you think uh, some people would get out? Well, certainly, I suppose. And the majority may get far enough to escape the heat and blast. Bear in mind that for some time, uh, enemy missiles would be concentrated on our retaliatory bases rather than on our cities. It sounds like evacuation would take a great deal of advanced planning. It does. So do all other aspects of civil offense, Mr. Edwards. When we are planning this not only for the survival, but for the recovery of our nation, government alone cannot do the job. Sounds like a tremendous job. But it can be done. A great deal has already been done. It will take the knowledge and resourcefulness of industry, labor, government, and every individual in our country. We at OCDM feel that the government should take the lead. On the federal level, we can plan, advise, draw up guidelines, but the real action for the survival of the people must stem from local and state governments. Much has been accomplished in this area. All of our 50 states, 240 target cities, and more than 2,500 communities have emergency plans ready to go into action. Continuity of government legislation has already been passed by many of our states. This will ensure that the government will continue to operate in the event of a, an attack by providing lines of succession to important positions of leadership. We can survive a nuclear war. We cannot survive by sitting back wishing that nuclear weapons did not exist or by hoping that no country would use them. These weapons do exist. They can be used. And as long as we are faced with this threat, we must be prepared on every front and in every home. Thank you very much, Mr. William Downer of OCDM for appearing on our program today and giving us some very, very important information about the matter of survival. Each of us, you know, has a responsibility, a tremendous responsibility, as a citizen. But government has certain responsibility to us. Now, our government, as you've heard, is preparing for a possible national emergency. What about you? 
Ever since our country became a major force in the science, economy, and culture of the world, people have traveled to our shores from every corner of the globe for a first-hand look at democracy at work. This has been especially true of the celebrated artists of all nations. Perhaps no decade of this century attracted more of these great personalities than the 20s. Many Americans can recall the times they arrived on the scene. The others can now recall it in retrospect. From France came Sarah Bernhardt, the greatest actress of her day. Known the world over for a lifetime of brilliant performances, she was hailed everywhere as the divine Sarah. In 1914, the French government crowned her magnificent career with a legion of honor. Madame Ernestine schumann heink her ringing contralto tones brought the world of opera to her feet. The 20s was an era for innovations. Americans were willing to try almost anything. They even began to accept dancing as one of the fine arts. They got a good look at the modern interpretive dancing of Ruth St. Denis, they got a good look, and they wondered. The Russian composer, conductor, and pianist Rachmaninoff arrived in America for a concert tour. Paderewski, Polish pianist and statesman. As an artist, he enjoyed more popularity than anyone since Liszt. John McCormick, the great Irish tenor who gained his greatest fame through the phonograph record. Enrico Caruso, the most brilliant operatic tenor of the age. No one before or since has been able to match the excitement of his Pagliacci. From the world of literature came the Irish playwright and wit, George Bernard Shaw. You in America, said Shaw, should trust to that volcanic political instinct which I have divined in you. The creator of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, who came to the United States to lecture on his belief in ghosts. Belgian playwright and Nobel Prize winner, Maurice Maeterlinck, who wrote the children's classic, The Bluebird. Michael Arlen, British-born novelist, author of the best-selling, The Green Hat. Joseph Conrad, the Polish-born English novelist from whose pen came powerful and disturbing tales of the sea. H.G. Wells, who envisioned the space age and war of the worlds and the shape of things to come. Of all these visitors, H.G. Wells alone would experience no sense of wonder at our atomic age, an age which he predicted as early as 1914. Well, so much for the past. Now we take a moment to present an important reminder concerning the future. The actions you take, should the civil defense warning signal sound, depend on the plans in your community. Learn what you can do to protect your home and family in case of nuclear attack. Call your local Civil Defense Office or write to Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization, Battle Creek, Michigan. Well, that's it for now. Be with us when we again look at people, places, and events in retrospect. This is Douglas Edwards saying goodbye. <laughs>